Today we're going to be looking at a channel called Subject Zero Science. Specifically, this is the bomb to worry about. What even is that? It's apparently a lot bigger than Sarbama, and it looks kind of like brain warp. You guys remember that? I've never seen anything like that. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience within the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this one out. On August 30th, 1961, at the Cape of Severny Sorry, Island, Obama. Nova Zembla. See enough videos on this. The Soviet Union tested the most powerful thermonuclear weapon ever created. The Tsar Bomba, code name Ivan. Its powerful blast yielded an unparalleled cool map 50 effect. megatons, enough to annihilate anything in a 35 kilometer radius. The explosion. Not annihilate. The fireball is about five kilometers radius, but it will certainly cause shockwaves and effects out to 35 kilometers. It'll burn you out to 60 kilometers. So. You are certainly not safe 35 kilometers away from it, unless you're in a bunker or something. So powerful that the light and sound of the blast could be seen and heard from up to 900 kilometers away. The heat from the explosion was so strong that it could cause third degree burns as far as 100 kilometers from ground zero. It the methodology I'm familiar with has it at about 60 kilometers. Maybe they're not looking at third, maybe they're looking at any burns at all. Stuff like that would use the inverse square law as far as its effects when you get further away from it. That is to say, you're double your distance from ground zero, you experience one quarter of the effects of radiation, light, burns, things of that nature. Mushroom cloud could be seen from as far as 161 kilometers away. A truly horrifying spectacle. That one I actually wouldn't be surprised if you could see it from far enough away, but I think that mainly depends on what the weather's like. As far as powerful bombs go, the Tsar Bomba set the record for the most potent ever detonated. Except it pales in comparison to the most right, powerful explosive known to mankind, with its core no bigger than a pinhead. What would happen if instead of uranium, plutonium and hydrogen, this substance is used? So uranium plutonium is a big important part that creates the fission bomb to create conditions hot enough to induce the fusion part, the lithium deuteride. I wonder what he's going to say. Something so powerful that science fiction calls it the doomsday weapon. Okay. Destroyer of Planets. Hello everyone, Subject Zero here. Neutrons are subatomic particles that have neutral charge. They have slightly greater mass than protons yes. and constitute the nuclei of atoms. They are roughly encountered in similar proportions, usually 50-50. Neutrons can only exist Except when things get heavier. You need the additional neutrons for the additional atomic stability as atoms get heavier and heavier and heavier. So things like uranium, you have way more neutrons. And that's because you have such a massive positive charge all on top of each other. Eventually, the electromagnetic force is going to become stronger than the strong nuclear force that holds the nucleus together. So they prevent it from tearing itself apart. Of course, a lot of really heavy elements are quite radioactive, so it prevents it from tearing itself apart for a limited period of time, let's say. Either by sharing space in nuclei, where the strong force helps maintain its characteristics, or with a whole lot of gravity, which is the case of a neutron star. Now we're just looking at neutron. What they're showing right here is just a neutron by itself and its composite materials of quarks. Not really talking about atomic structure at this point. You see, free neutrons won't last long by themselves. Typically, their half-life is about 611 seconds or a little over 10 minutes. And in that and they're very likely to be absorbed by something. Water is a great moderator and it slows down neutrons quite effectively. It's one of the key principles of how nuclear power plants work is you need to slow neutrons down so they can cause more fission. So neutrons can be slowed down and absorbed by things relatively quickly. The neutrons in a nuclear reactor do not last 15 minutes. One single neutron releases one million electron volts. 
But how much energy is that? Million electron volts, a lot relative to individual molecules in, say, a coal power plant. But when a uranium fissions, it releases about 200 million electron volts. So depends on your self a scale. So not great, not terrible. Well, a single neutron releases about 1 million electron volts, which is insignificant. But if we had, let's say, 1 kilogram, then things become a bit more interesting. In these calculations, we assume ne that one... Neutronium? I think I've heard about that in sci-fi. I think what he's getting at is neutron star matter. ...of neutron has 6 times 10 to the 23rd number of particles. By that, we can calculate the energy multiplying the result by 1 million electron volt. A gram of pure neutrons. Good luck getting your, getting your hands on something like that. Short half-life and free neutrons aren't exactly... They don't exactly park. <laughs> <laughs> They're usually going somewhere. You usually get neutrons from a nuclear reactor, and you think of it as a neutron field. Um, like, experiments are typically done when you activate something. The classic experiment that I see in a lot of uh, colleges involves, like, a strip of gold or some other metal that gets activated by neutrons, and what activated means is you make it into a radioactive substance. So most gold is gold-197, which is stable. It absorbs a neutron, turns into gold-198, which is radioactive. But this is when it's exposed to a field of neutrons being produced in a nuclear reactor. So just the very idea of having a gram of the substance, like it's a commodity of some sort, is just baffling. And you would need the extreme gravitational conditions on a neutron star in order to pull off something like that. You see it in sci-fi as like this super dense armor plating for interstellar battleships of some sort. I remember it being an upgrade in Stellaris. I'm sure it's seen its fair share of sci-fi applications. It's only theoretical and if it exists it's under extreme conditions like neutron stars. There's a lot we don't know about how exactly it's it's packed. And if you want to hear more about neutron stars, I'll pin a link to a video that talks more about neutron stars, but this thing's really out there. And I'm guessing he's going to talk about making a bomb out of this stuff. Convert the results into joules and divide it by the total energy of one ton of TNT. At the end of one kilogram total decay, the full energy released would be equivalent to 11.5 kilotons of TNT. That is almost as powerful as the first nuclear bomb detonated Little Good luck finding a kilogram of neutrons. <laughs> Though it releases almost the same energy as the first nuclear weapons, I must point out that the explosion would not be the same. As neutrons decay, it will release all that energy throughout its half-lives. Curiously enough, it would be releasing energy for about 15 half-lives or two and a half hours. That's the other thing. You're somehow keeping these neutrons in magical stasis that their half-life function is turned off. If we're going to make a bomb about this, then it's got so many barriers. So back to the title of this video, this is the bomb to worry about. I'm no more worried about this than a wizard turning the earth into a candy bar or something like that. <laughs> It involves just as much silliness. However, there is a caveat. It's density. How dense is it, you may ask? Quite. Well, neutronium is so dense that 5 cubic centimeters of it would weigh 5.5 trillion kilograms. I've heard a teaspoon of neutron star matter compared to 10,000 melted down aircraft carriers. Just putting that little, little spoonful there. That is equivalent to 900 pyramids of Giza. <laughs> on a That's another one. There you go. That's another one. The substance is believed to exist as the core of neutron stars. I must also point out that neutrons have weak interaction with matter. Okay, there you go. And yeah, <laughs> unknown neutronium? <laughs> sure. So something purely theoretical. Capturing them would only be possible through using an anti-gravity stasis field. Something straight out of a science fiction book. Okay, he's admitting it's sci-fi, anti-gravity stasis, but it's not gravity that causes radioactive decay. What's going to stop your neutrons from really undergoing beta decay? Well, in the case of a neutron star, it's actually not anti-gravity, it's just gravity. <laughs> so maybe you need just gravity. Not sure what he's getting at with anti-gravity. Also sci-fi. This is necessary for two reasons. 
one to stop neutrons from decaying and also second to hold them against gravity okay to hold yes it's going to be very heavy and it's going to fall into the sure or more like depending on how much of the stuff he's going to use it could go the other way around where the earth falls on this if he's going to make a really big thing that's comparable to a neutron star might even find a happy me medium where earth and this substance forms a binary system that kind of depends on how much of this stuff he intends to use and synthesize magic you need to keep in mind that this substance would be in the form of a degenerate neutron gas not solid for the sake of argument let's assume that we do have the machine and let's name it zarina also <laughs> i will not consider factors like gravitational pull Yes, make it into the brain warp machine. Kind of reminds me of Action Lab, except it's an animated thing rather than him doing a live experiment with magical substances. Silly, and he acknowledges how ludicrous this idea is, so that's, that's good. Pressure, among other things. I will only focus on the total energy of the system for my calculations. Lastly, Let's also assume that the anti-gravity stasis field will fail at 4 kilometers above the surface. Airburst detonation. How much damage would a teaspoon of neutronium cause to the planet? Using the same calculation logic as before, you will arrive at this number. <laughs> the question is, would the spoon survive? So is the spoon also made out of neutronium? This is tons of TNT equivalent. To pretty much all people on planet Earth, this number makes no sense. Well, 125 quadrillion tons of TNT, that's significantly more energy than the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, but significantly less energy than Earth's gravitational binding energy. So that's an extinction level event, though the Earth won't be destroyed. Let's see if I'm right. Down to more sensible stuff. A good way to look at it would be to compare to the most iconic asteroid Here we go. <laughs> to ever hit. Earth, I figured. <laughs> the Chicxulub Impactor, the asteroid that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. Estimations put the asteroid in between 11 and 81 kilometers in diameter. The impact is estimated to be in between 1. That's a massive range. I didn't realize there are any estimates of it at 81 kilometers. 3 to 58 Yotta Joules. Yada Joules. 1.3 followed by 24 zeros. Shows you how small the unit of measure that a joule is. That much energy created a crater 150 kilometers in diameter and 20 kilometers deep. 5 cubic centimeters of neutrons is 200 times more energy dense than the Chicxulub lower estimated okay. impact energy and 4.5 times at the higher end. Yeah, I don't think that's survivable. <laughs> by humanity in the fact that not all energy would be released through impact if it were we could extrapolate that zarina would make a crater 675 kilometers in diameter and 90 kilometers deep another way to look at it would be if we were to take its first half-life energy and then divide it by the number of seconds it takes for one half-life to pass what's crazy about this is it's a very expensive very exotic sci-fi weapon that you would think even a civilization with magical technology it would probably be easier to just redirect a bigger asteroid to earth than to make magical neutronium and wield the thing but i guess with if, if anti-gravity technology is really that expensive and you could somehow just yoink stuff out of neutron stars then maybe i don't know at the very first second the energy released by Zarina would be equivalent to 2 million Tsar Bombas. Yeah, the Tsar Bombas, nothing at this point. I like that he gave it an affectionate nickname. It's a bit silly. The total area of destruction of the Tsar Bomba is 3,850 kilometers square. Zarina would have enough power to destroy the entire surface of the planet on the very first second. 16 times over again you can cause that much destructive force by just using more asteroids you would think that and that's at least somewhat grounded in reality It'd be very difficult to do asteroid redirects towards earth but compared to using magic it's at least some level of possibility and that would keep this happening for the next teaspoon. 610 seconds until its power is halved by only eight times over. 
So, I mean, he's emphasizing this, but it's all based on something that may or may not exist. So he might as well say it's a teaspoon of magic. I don't know. It's, I'm having conflicting views. I'm liking the order of magnitude explanations, and it's rare that you find people actually do this stuff, it, it, at least do the math right. And he at least had the disclaimer that neutronium might not even be real. By the time it would take to reach low levels, the planet has already been through nine and a half hours of extreme destruction. Even at this point, the energy being released per second would still be equivalent to 1.5 kilotons of TNT. The other thing, I mean, yeah, he's getting into the whole, the whole time lapse thing. Something that reactive and it's going to stay emitting that same at that same decay rate after the fact, I don't think so. And that's just based on, and I know that was an assumption, but based on how nuclear weapons actually work, a lot of the decay products go away within the first 72 hours after detonation. And but then there are stuff that is going to stick there for stay around for for a while, some on the order of years to decades, some for a very long time. But the reason why you stay inside for at least 72 hours, hole up in in your bunker is a lot of the uh, those relatively short lived radioisotopes have them go away. So a big assumption with this whole linear rate there, but anything releasing that kind of energy and claiming it's not going to have some sort of effect on the rest of what comprises this weapon is a bit silly. But maybe the magical anti-gravity will take care of that, because it also apparently slows down the decay time. It would take five more hours for the remaining energy to be released and reach meaningless levels. Totally 14 and a half hours level. of pure hell. By the end of this event, everything is destroyed. However, only 11% of the ocean's water have evaporated. At least, some good news. <laughs> okay, I was wondering about that because he showed the oceans getting evaporated in the animation, but I think that was mainly just to show it gray because it's all dark and gritty with something like this happening. I'm not sure how I feel about this one. I would not worry about this. Again, no more than I'd worry about any sort of magical powers somehow coming into our version of reality. It was interesting to see just the order of magnitude comparison. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.